So here we have a, a great a great clip from uh, a, uh, a segment that I uploaded years ago on my previous YouTube channel. And it's basically a mashup of uh, Rabbi Zacharias and John Piper answering the question on why God allows evil. I'm going to go ahead and play the clip, but I want to first deal with who I stand behind in regards to this question. And I would definitely prefer or stand behind John Piper. Um, here, here's the issue with the late rabbi. Uh, he was far more philosophical than he was biblical. And I think that that's a, a problem, especially when you have these Q&As where young people are answering questions and they, they, they want precise answers. Um, now, when we look at philosophical theology, it's a branch of theology in which its philosophical methods are utilized to arrive at a clear understanding of divine truths. So it tends to be, it tends to lead into drawn out stories and experiences. And I'm going to deal with why that's a problem. Uh, now, I stand on the side of those who hold to biblical theology, to put it simply, is theology of the Bible. Theology meaning the study of God's word. This makes it more precise and to, and to the point as opposed to philosophical theology. And that's why I believe it's much more effective. One of the bad things about people like the late rabbi and their, their philosophical thinking is they tend to draw out responses um, and they draw on and on and on. And, I, you know, sometimes I'll be listening to a, a clip of rabbi and the, the clip will be 10 minutes, literally eight, nine minutes of him talking. And you can tend to forget what the initial question was. A lot of these guys, they talk and they talk and they talk. And they get into these different stories. And the, 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 the bad thing about that is you tend to forget just listening to them what you even initially asked. You know, quite these biblical questions, these Christian questions are very easy to answer. It, it doesn't it's not you know, these aren't hard questions. Uh, you should be able to answer them within a couple minutes. Get right to the point. It shouldn't take you eight, nine, ten minutes to answer a simple question. And that's why I really enjoyed the, the uh, Q&A segments that Ligonier used to hold with R.C. Sproul. I mean, they would ask these guys questions on the panel and they would answer them really quickly because it's not that complicated. And, and men like Rabbi tended to draw it out and make it more complicated than it was. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and play the clip of both of these men giving their their own take on why God allows evil. Uh, this question is for Rabbi. Um, you mentioned the story of, of that, uh, I think you said he was Jewish and he was shot by, uh, at that, I, I think it was a concentration camp or something like that. And I'm going to play the devil's advocate for a bit and pretend I'm Sam Harris, no pun intended of course. Um, you stated that God was watching, God watched the gentleman pull the trigger. If God was watching, why didn't he make that trigger not work? Why didn't he make that poor individual just pass out while he was digging the grave? Uh, okay. I believe Sam Harris would ask that type of question and demand an answer. Yes, I appreciate that question. Um, the Playing the devil's advocate, you said that why didn't God keep the man from pulling the trigger? rather than allowing the man to pull the trigger and then watch over him and uh, bringing about some kind of judgment. I would say this to you, that the supreme ethic that God has given to us is the ethic of love. It is the peak of all intellectual and emotional alignment. This thing we call love, which places value upon the other person of worth and as something to be protected. It was interesting of all people, it was Oscar Wilde who on his deathbed in his 40s, by his lover by his side, Robbie Ross, he turned to Robbie and he said, did you love any one of those little boys for their own sake? It was an incredible question to ask by a man who was a hedonist on his deathbed in his 40s. And he said, Robbie, did you ever love any one of those little boys for their own sake? And Robbie Ross said, no, I can't say I did. He said, bring me a minister. Bring me a minister. And it was in his magnificent poem, The Ballad of Reading Jail, that Oscar Wilde said, 
Only Christ was big enough to cleanse his heart and forgive him for all that he had done. The point even the hedonist realized was that in pleasure also, value and love are the supreme ethics that can be treasured. But you can never have love without intrin intrinsically weaving into it the freedom of the will. You cannot have love without the freedom of the will. If you are compelled by some machine to a certain decision, you can never love. You can comply, but you will never be choosing to express that sentiment and the reality of love. If love is a supreme ethic, and freedom is indispensable to love, and God's supreme goal for you and for me is that we will love him with all of our hearts and love our neighbors as ourselves, for him to violate our free will would be to violate that which is a necessary component so that love can flourish and love can be expressed. If you're asking for God to always stop the trigger, why not God stop everything else? Next time you hold a cup of boiling water, he makes it frozen water instead. Next time you're about to cross the street and you're gonna be hit, he pulls your leg back. What you're asking for is a different entity than humanity. As wonderful as it may seem that in stopping that, you think he is protecting you from that which is destructive. The greatest denial that you're asking for is the freedom of your will to be able to choose and to love God with all your heart and all your soul. When you've got love as a supreme ethic and the freedom of the will to choose that love, all of the other contingencies come in and can become explained why it is possible to either choose or to reject so that love can ultimately reign supreme. If you want compliance and, a and some kind of a mechanical response, your question itself will self-destruct. You're asking the question because you're free to ask it, and you're free to ask it because you're free to love. And when you love him, in spite of all of the contraries that you see around us, you're trusting him for having the supreme wisdom and the knowledge to ultimately bring a pattern out of it all. We think, for example, we know so much. The story is told in Middle Eastern folklore of this man who lost his horse that ran away. And when the horse ran away, the neighbor came to him and said, you know, bad luck, isn't it? Your horse is gone. He said, what do I know about these things? A few days later, the horse came back with 20 other wild horses. And the neighbor came and said, amazing, it's not bad luck, it's good luck. You've got 20 more. The man says, what do I know about these things? His young son is going and taming one of the new horses. That young horse kicks him and breaks his leg. The neighbor comes and says, terrible, isn't it? Your son's leg is broken. Bad luck that these horses came. The fellow says, what do I know about good luck and bad luck? A few days go by and a bunch of thugs are coming, looking for recruits to join their gang. And they're looking for all the able-bodied young men. And they're about to pick this young man, but find out his leg is broken. And they say, we don't want him. We're going to move on to the next house. So the man comes and says, good luck, isn't it? Your son's leg was broken. In one little series of episodes we don't know what lies ahead why don't you wait till you stand before God face to face and you will find out there were reasons why he didn't stop that trigger so that you will see the heinousness of evil and see the majesty of love and good managing to navigate yourself by the pil as the pilgrim's progress to come to the so, celestial city. so crucially and the reason according to this question that you've asked is um, how could you get any comfort by a God who's out of control when the planes flew into the uh, towers in New York and I was interviewed and people would ask me is where was God in this and I said well God could have very easily blown those planes off course by a little puff of wind and he didn't do it, therefore God was right there ordaining that this happen, because he could have stopped it just like that and everybody who believes in God should say that because that's how powerful he is and Jesus said the wind obeys him and so just a simple wind by the command of Jesus would have blown those planes away and they would have crashed and 60 people would have died instead of thousands of people. Um, but he didn't do that. Why is it comforting to believe that? And the answer is because there are 10,000 orphans 
who wonder if they have a future. Will they have a future if God isn't powerful for them? I'm coming to those families and I'm saying, when they ask me, do you think God ordained the death of my daddy? I say, yes, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But the very power by which God governs all evils enables him to govern your life. And he has total authority to turn this and every other evil in your life for your everlasting good. And that's your only hope in this world and in the next. And therefore, if you sacrifice the sovereignty of God in order to get him off the hook in the death of your daddy, you sacrifice everything. You don't want to go there. The sovereignty of God while creating problems for his involvement in sin and evil is the very rock-solid foundation that enables us to carry on in life. Where would we turn if we didn't have a God to help us deal with the very evils that he has ordained coming to our lives? So yes, absolutely, I believe in the sovereignty of God and I believe in its comforting effects.